This semester, we've been covering controversies in the Old Testament. Uh, the Old Testament is a section of our Bible that we don't like paying as much attention to because there's not as much Jesus in the Old Testament, so we're perhaps not looking uh, there for as much moral wisdom and guidance and uh, to answer some of the most important questions to us Christians in particular. But the Old Testament is still a core part of our Bible and we can't afford to ignore it. So this semester at Rasha Christi, we have been attempting to uh, confront some of the stranger things that are a barrier to uh, Christians when they're trying to engage with their Old Testament, trying to read their uh, Old Testament. When you read about the violence in the Old Testament, you might ask yourself, is the God of the Old Testament actually evil? Um, the, uh, there, are his, there are reasons why people think the Exodus and the conquest of Canaan did not happen historically. Um, and the question we're going to be tackling tonight is, were the Israelites or is the Bible uh, polytheistic? So, uh, I've lost click. There we go. Um, here we go. Recap of the semester. Uh, week one, we covered how do we get the Old Testament, which is the textual transmission and the process of inspiration. Week two, we covered the Genesis, uh, chapters 1 through 11, the, the genre of Genesis and how to read it properly. Then, once we know how to read it properly, we can ask the question whether it fits with what we know from science. Uh, week four, we discussed genetic evidence and whether it makes it impossible for there to be a historical Adam and Eve. Um, then we talked about whether the Exodus is historical. Then we talked about whether the conquest of Canaan is historical. And then we asked the question, did God command Genesis, uh, genocide in the conquest of Canaan? Uh, so were the ancient Israelites polytheists? Uh, this is what we're going to be discussing tonight. And the long and short of it is, yes, they were uh, absolutely polytheists. Uh, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Uh, and 1 Kings 19.18 says that there are only 7,000 faithful left in Israel. And th this is not news. The, the, the people of Israel were constantly straying away from God to worship other gods. Uh, that's what we read in Exodus and then uh, Deuteronomy and Numbers and Judges and so on and so forth. Uh, every major conflict in the Old Testament is driven by this. Um, and so when we ask questions, were the Israelites worshiping other gods? Uh, we're going to find the answer is yes. Uh, but So that's not actually an interesting question. And the more interesting question is, was the Bible originally polytheistic. Um, I think that uh, this uh, question, whenever we, um, uh, th this question is valuable, and uh, we need to ask it, but this is the question that we are actually going to be able to tackle tonight um, just by looking into the, into the Bible. So here is the controversy. I actually got this quote from a local Aggie who I think summarized it quite well. The God of the Old Testament does not seem to be omniscient, omnipotent, or omnipresent, especially in Genesis. So somewhere along the way he became those things. Eating from the tree of knowledge is supposed to make us more godlike, uh, and after eating the fruit we become like the God of the Old Testament. If God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, then we miss the mark by a long shot when we ate from the tree. It's interesting how ancient gods are more human-like and flawed, but nowadays peop most people worship a perfect god. The modern god is an evolved form of the original ancient god. Also, Judaism was originally polytheistic, technically henotheistic. We'll discuss what that means. Uh, so it wouldn't make sense to have an omnipotent god if there are multiple gods. This is, like I said, from a private correspondence with a fellow Aggie. We won't have time to discuss each of the points made here tonight uh, because it, there's simply too much. And, uh, but I think that what we discuss tonight will give you a framework for dealing with some of these other controversies in what I hope is a more coherent manner than you might otherwise be prepared to tackle them. 
So the, the particular claim here that we're going to be tackling tonight is Judaism was originally polytheistic, technically henotheistic, uh, and so it wouldn't make sense to have an omnipotent God if there are multiple gods. So Yahweh is just one of many. The God of the Old Testament, he's just one of many, and that's the crucial claim. Um, the real problem here is a challenge to God's uniqueness within the biblical text. If Yahweh is just one of many gods, why does he get our worship above all the rest? The claims which feed into this controversy are the following. The Israelite religion had to evolve from polytheism. That is a claim made by scholars like Jan Osman, uh, who is a German Egyptologist. Uh, he says, monotheism asserts its identity by opposing itself to polytheism. So every instance of monotheism that we see is actually an evolved form of polytheism. Uh, another claim, the Tanakh allegedly Lee, yes, alludes to the existence of other gods. Uh, and it contradicts itself by talking about other gods because it is supposed to be monotheistic. So it was originally polytheistic, and so it talks about all these other gods, and then people come along at a later time and change it, and so therefore it contradicts itself. Um, we, uh, the, sorry, for some context, the Tanakh is the Torah, the uh, Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. Those are the three sections of the Old Testament. I may have pronounced them incorrectly. Uh, so whenever we say Tanakh, it's actually a, a abbreviation or an acronym. Uh, and then the third claim, which features into the controversy we'll be dealing with tonight, is monotheism is a later addition to the Israelite religion and Judaism and, and Christianity by extension. So most importantly, it's an artificial uh, addition. So, so the people who added it to Judaism, or the, the change that was made to the Israelite religion, was made uh, arbitrarily. Somebody said, oh, we'd rather be monotheists. That's what we're going to be dealing with tonight. Before we get into that, I'd like to remind us uh, about some of the commitments that we at Rational Christie have been trying to hold to this semester. Uh, we have been holding to inspiration that the Bible is completely true in everything that it teaches, and God is the ultimate source behind the scriptures. Uh, specifically, we deny a model of inspiration that's based off of dictation. We say that God inspired the biblical text by working through the lives and contexts of the original authors. And so whenever we are looking into reading the Bible, we should understand the original context and the lives of the original authors, because that's the way God moved. When we were discussing the historicity of the conquest and how to read the uh, Genesis 1 through 11, that was a big focus uh, about the genres that the original authors would have been familiar with and the literary forms they would have been likely to adapt, or adopt. Yes. Uh, inerrancy. Everything that the scripture teaches is without fault. Um, and uh, the, the people who wrote the Bible, did so with their distinctive personalities and literary styles. So we have to read the Bible and then interpret it to find out what it teaches, and then we can say that those teachings are without fault. A lot of what we're going to be discussing tonight will come from this individual, Dr. Michael Heiser, and this book, Unseen Realm. We uh, can highly recommend this book, uh, and we can also highly recommend uh, Dr. Heiser's podcast, which is called the Naked, the Naked Bible Podcast. It goes through a lot of this material and will be, it's a great thing to listen to when you, whenever you have car rides and downtime. So, here's the question. <laughs> Polytheism in my Bible, it's more likely than you think. The Tanakh is obviously not, not polytheistic. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. From Isaiah 44, 6. To you it was shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other beside him. And I have a few other verses. If you're watching, you can pause and read those. The point is, the Bible clearly says there is no God besides Yahweh. Uh, so we can't be dealing with polytheism. But remember, the argument isn't that the Bible doesn't contain monotheism. The argument is that it also contains polytheism and therefore, no, number one, contradicts itself 
and also demonstrates an evolution from polytheism to monotheism. So we can't uh, get rid of that claim just by looking at instances of supposed monotheism. Uh, that won't get us anywhere in the argument. So we need to look at verses like, or passages like Psalm 82. God, which is the Hebrew word Elohim, has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods, once again, the Hebrew word Elohim. He holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Salah. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted. I'm going to skip over some parts. Uh, could somebody, uh, there's somebody in the waiting room. Sorry. Just, I don't want them to miss any more of my excellent talk than they already have. I say, you are gods, Elohim, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like men. Then we have passages like Psalm 89. Let the heavens praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God feared in the council of the holy ones, great and terrible above all that are round about him? Uh, Deuteronomy 32. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father, and he will show you your elders, and they will tell you when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance. When he separated the sons of men, he fixed the bounds of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. And then Job 38, 4 through 7. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Um, dot, dot, dot. Uh, on what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So. Uh, I'm going to take a step back. Does anybody, I, I just quoted four different passages, and probably a lot of things were going through your head. Does anybody have anything to say to those? Here's what you might be thinking. Psalm 82, obviously, quotes uh, Elohim, so that's going to be, I think, our main focus. Uh, but these other verses, uh, the holy ones um, in Psalm 89, the sons of God in Deuteronomy 32, and the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. That doesn't necessarily seem to commit us to anything resembling polytheism, ignoring Psalm 82 for a minute. Um, so this is where we get to the point where it's important to recognize the context again. In the Mesopotamian context, this language, morning stars sang together, and sons of God, is stock imagery for divine beings. And we will get a little bit more into that later. But I wanted to make sure that whenever you are looking at these passages, you understand that they are significant for this question. This language is the same language used by all of these people in this area, um, all of the Mesopotamian authors. Uh, and it is consistent in the Old Testament as well. So Elohim, who are these passages spoken of in uh, who are these beings spoken of in these passages? They're called Elohim, uh, and it's the same word in the singular and the plural, a lot like the English words moose and sheep. Uh, the moose released the moose. Um, the, the sheep um, is versus the sheep are. So the way that you tell these uh, words apart in context is you actually have to look at the way they're conjugated, the way the verbs uh, change depending on which noun they're referring to. So that's not a controversial issue. That's not a question. We know that one is referring to a singular God and the other Elohim is referring to multiple God. Uh, they also are shown to have authority. Uh, in Deuteronomy 32, it says that, the, I've lost control of my clicker. Um, in Deuteronomy 32, it says that, Yahweh divided the nations amongst the sons of God. Um, Psalm 82 uh, says that God is judging them for corrupt administration of the nations. So they have authority. They're called morning stars. So they're referred to in the same way. They're referred to with the language of celestial bodies. Uh, for a little bit of extra context, morning star generally refers to Venus, which is one of the few celestial bodies still visible during the day. It's bright enough to be seen during the day. Uh, and they're called sons of God. 
uh, in Psalm 82 and Job 1, as well as Genesis 6, a passage we did not discuss. So what else do we know about these beings and their role in the Bible? It can be hard to know more about these beings and their role in the Bible if we're just looking in the Bible, which is why in 1928 we had the great fortune of uncovering a site called Ugarit. Specifically, it's three, shite, uh, three sites, one of which is Ras Shamra, uh, one is Ras Ibn Hani, um, but they're all referred to under the blanket name of Ugarit, the city of Ugarit, which is a port city. It was a very large and important port city in Syria, but it wasn't discovered until 1928 because it collapsed uh, during a Bronze Age collapse, which as we discussed when we were discussing the historicity of the conquest of Canaan, there was this massive Bronze Age collapse, and historians aren't really sure what caused it. But because uh, Ugar was abandoned and then covered up and preserved, uh, we now have access to the literature of the, um, the, the Ugaritic literature. Uh, Ugaritic, previously unknown uh, as far as what the language was, uh, but we knew that it was Northwest Semitic. We just didn't have any surviving texts. Uh, we've discovered f uh, roughly 1,500 uh, tablets, uh, and it's dated between 13th and 12th century BC. So it's roughly contemporaneous with a lot of what we've been discussing. If you guys remember the Exodus dating discussions we've had and trying to figure out when the Exodus occurred. It was a rather laborious and fruitless process or discussion. So. Here is a particular text of interest called the Baal Cycle, which describes the, the mythology or the worldview of this group of Canaanites. The uh, city of Ugarit was a Canaanite city. To put it in context, we have Ugaritic, and then we have modern Hebrew. Modern Hebrew has gone through some challenging times and has, gone, ha has had to been reconstructed largely uh, once uh, be because the Jews were in diaspora for so many years. So they had to kind of reconstruct their language to arrive at modern Hebrew. Uh, but they are still related languages, and they're related to Arabic more distantly. Uh, Ugaritic is very close. If you guys notice, at the bottom of this graph, you'll notice Malachim. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, you'll realize Malachim is the exact same word uh, in Ugarit and uh, Hebrew for angel or messenger. Uh, so this is what the Ugaritic divine council looks like. Uh, what I mean by divine council, uh, it is the way that the Canaanite people, the way that the Semitic people of, of these areas conceived of God and his relationship to the world. He governed the world and he administered the world through a series of divine beings. So you have El, the God above all, you have Baal, who is the co-regent, which means he rules alongside El, uh, and uh, Asherah, or Ashter Ashterah, um, who is El's consort. Uh, whenever we compare that, uh, w this is, by the way, synthesized from literature. If you want to fact check this, you'll have to go learn Ugaritic. Uh, when we compare this to what we see in the Bible, this is a summary from Mike Heiser. Uh, Israelite religion had an assembly of heavenly hosts under the authority of Yahweh. Ugaritic tablets were found to contain words and phrases describing a council of gods that are conceptually and linguistically parallel to the Bible. There are explicit references to a council or assembly of El, in some cases overlapping word for word with those in the Hebrew Bible. Um, I seem to have lost track of a diagram. So, whenever we're talking about a divine council, uh, God has taken his place in the divine council and is judging these beings because they weren't doing their jobs correctly. Uh, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like men. Um, so, El, the one above all, uh, can he... Uh, his position in this council is the same as Yahweh's position in the Hebrew divine council. 
But we've made some changes. We got rid of Bail, and we got rid of Astra. Uh, everyone else is pretty much in the exact same position. We have the Sons of God, who God has uh, given authority to, uh, to rule over the nations and to conduct various tasks. And then the Malachim, who are given a specific task of being messengers uh, between the heavenly realm and the earthly realm. We can ignore that for now. The point of all of this is to say that as far as the writers of the Old Testament are concerned, other divine beings exist. They're not, you can't just boil it down to angels, uh, because we see that those are distinct, uh, and they have a different level of authority and a different position in the divine council. So one of my concerns whenever I was doing this research and whenever I first heard about this topic is, so what you're saying is Israel just took the divine council idea from the Canaanites and from the uh, Ugaritic uh, mythology and adapted it for their own purposes. And that certainly is a way of, of taking this data, but you have to think about what was going on in that time. These people are existing in the same place, they're reading the same literature, they're occasionally interacting with one another, as we see in the Canaanite conquest, there was interaction, um, and they're occasionally taking each other's ideas and their, their, their language to describe certain phenomena and certain ideas. So when you're, whenever you're actually comparing the overlap between two different cultures, you can have somebody is totally ignorant of another culture's ideas and language. Uh, you can have a somewhat familiarity. Um, or, as I would say that we're dealing with in this case, we have some conscious imitation or borrowing, and we also have a subconscious shared heritage. So they're dealing with the same ideas and they're writing in the same way because those are the ideas that they share. Uh, that's, that's part of their culture, that's part of their language. And then, like we said, the, the Ugaritic language and the Hebrew language overlap in many ways. So, any comments before I discuss our options when dealing with this literature? Yes, it's a very sophisticated, very carefully drawn smiley face. When you're talking about borrowing, I guess, do you ever do, well, who, who had these ideas on, uh, you know, codified first? Because that was, a, you know, I guess you don't know. But that's the earliest one outside of Israel that you have that has this, has the Divine Council idea. Mm hmm yes. Uh, Dante? What separates these other gods from archangels? Like, I when I hear it, it almost sounds as if it's like because the angels are like supposedly like created by him, they could be referred to, I guess, as his children in a way. What makes these gods different than archangels in the same position? Okay, I'm not sure if you guys in the Zoom could hear that question, um, but the question is uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so, firstly, in answer to Julie's question, she asked, um, who thought of this idea first? And once again, we don't necessarily even need to ask that question. We can ask a simpler question is, why did they share these ideas? They may not have shared these ideas because uh, one was copying from another. They may have shared these ideas from long before I, either of these cultures decided to start producing written works. And then whenever they did to start, start producing written works, they shared this idea, um, and they shared this understanding of the world. Okay? Any questions from the Zoom? No? Okay. So, like I said, we have a few options. Here are the two main categories. We can reject this language, and we can pursue naturalistic interpretations uh, to where we reduce the... I guess, ontological or, or, or metaphysical status of these Elohim to human judges. Or we can accept the divine council concept and take it as evidence that 
the Israelites evolved from polytheism to monotheism. And in order to write the Bible, they had to, etc. Et they, they had to make those changes. What we're going to do is, of course, the most enlightened view, because we here at Resha Christi are the most enlightened. We're going to say that both sides are idiots without any further opinion or explanation. No. That's obviously not what we're going to do. I see somebody just joined the uh, Zoom, so I'm going to go over this again. Uh, we've, we were covering the language of other divine beings and of a divine council in the Old Testament, and now we have these two options. We can reject, count, if, if you want to go over those passages, I'm sorry, you'll just have to watch the recording. Uh, we can go over this, uh, we can reject the council language and embrace a naturally, naturalistic interpretation which reduces the status of these Elohim, these beings who are called Elohim, to human judges, for example. Or we can accept the divine council and interpret it as evidence that the Israelites evolved from polytheism to monotheism. We're going to do this. N no, no, not. So, is this polytheism? So, firstly, no. Uh, I think we already discussed, in, in the verses I showed you, whenever we said, oh, the Bible's obviously monotheistic, we say, there is no God besides Yahweh. Um, and when, whenever we look at this, the term Elohim doesn't always refer to uh, beings we understand to be divine, like the resurrected, dead spirit of Samuel. Uh, whenever Saul visits the, uh, a necromancer or a diviner uh, to try and contact Samuel, who is dead at this point, uh, he says, The king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a god. Once again, the word Elohim, coming up out of the earth. He said to her, what is his appearance? And she said, an old man is coming up, and he is wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel. And he bowed with his face to the ground and paid homage. 1 Samuel 28, 13 through 14. So whenever we're referring to beings that have the label Elohim, this tells us that we're not just dealing with uh, the same thing that Yahweh is. We're dealing with a a variety. There is a diversity in the heavenly realm. And Elohim is just a catch-all term to describe anything that exists in the heavenly realm. We can see that these other gods are clearly not what Yahweh is, especially if Yahweh has the authority to judge them and sentence them to death like men. And we know that these gods are not meant to receive worship, especially from the Israelites. And that does not go so well. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So, is this henotheism? This is actually a term I was unfamiliar with until about two weeks ago. And uh, henotheism is not the right word, but it is a pretty cool word. Here, here's Heiser's evaluation. He wrote a paper in 2008 called Monotheism, Polytheism, monolatry or henotheism toward an assessment of divine plurality in the Hebrew Bible. Um, I can't really recommend it because it's unless you know Hebrew, <laughs> uh, which I don't, but I have this quote. Historically, henotheism assumes all gods are species equals and the elevation of one god is due to sociopolitical factors, not theological nuancing. Quoting Max Mueller's seminal work on the subject, Yusa writes that henotheism was a technical term coined to designate a peculiar form of polytheism. So yeah, I worship one god or only a few gods, but I'm really not comparing that god to all of these other gods. Um, and I only do this because I want it to rain on my crops. That's, that's the idea. So that definitely does not capture what we see in the Old Testament. and there have been attempts to redefine this term in the literature and, and say that it applies to not only a sociopolitical factors, but also the, ec the theological distinction between Yahweh and the other divine beings. But that's probably not going to stick, and so we don't need to be married to this term. Uh, monotheism. So here's where we get back into dealing with the conservative uh, theological traditions that have been with us since the Church Fathers. Uh, 
people will read these verses and say, well, it obviously can't mean what it seems to be saying in this verse, so there need to be other explanations. So you could say the other gods are just angels. And as, as far as I can tell, I've been dealing with this content for a while now, trying to, to think about the best way to give this presentation. And I don't think that this is too, too far off the mark. Angels are beings who, they're spiritual beings who exist in the heavenly realm, and they serve God, and they're given specific tasks. And finally, to get back to Dante's question, I know that that was burning uh, in everybody's mind, uh, whenever we're dealing with archangels, that seems to refer to an even higher elevation of specific spiritual beings. Uh, now, I do think that the term archangel uh, might be interchangeable with the use of Elohim, and, and I, I have reasons for that I could explain. But the term angel, in specifically, uh, it, in particular, just means messenger, much like Malachim in Hebrew. And so it is a functional designation which falls short of describing the role that we see the Bene Elohim or, or the Elohim serving in the Old Testament, which is they have authority over the nations and that they have been judging unjustly, which is not something that we understand angels to be doing. That's not activity that we understand them to be engaging in. So then we turn to our second possible alternative. The other gods are just humans. Um, but whenever we turn to Psalm 89, oh, sorry. Whenever you go to uh, Bible Hub, uh, I, I like this one because it, 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 it puts a lot of other translations and a lo lot of other resources kind of at your fingertips. So you can actually click on this uh, circle up here that says comment. It's short for commentary. And you can go through historical commentaries that have been historically relied upon and, and deemed uh, true. Every single one of these pre prefers, sorry, all but two, prefer a human interpretation of what we read in Psalm 82, which, uh, According to Heiser's evaluation, according to my evaluation, according to everyone uh, who has gone over this material uh, in order to do this kind of a presentation, this interpretation falls short, especially now that we have the Ugaritic literature to compare it to. And so we know that these sorts of ideas existed in the minds of the biblical authors at the time when they wrote the Bible. So Psalm 89, like I said. Um, Psalm 82, we have the human view, but when we look at Psalm 89, Let the heavens praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones, for who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord? So it becomes clear that when we're talking about the council of the holy ones, or the divine council, uh, to, to reduce this to language to apply to humans seems to be taking this verse uh, a, a bit too far. Take, it, it's stretching that interpretation. Uh, I'm, I'm going to move on from this because I honestly don't have much more to say about the human interpretation, but perhaps there are some people who would like to speak up in defense of it. Uh, because cause like I said, this is probably, if, if you've looked into these verses uh, but aren't familiar with Heiser, Heiser, then this is probably the interpretation that you're familiar with and probably the one that you're like, oh, I, I guess that kind of makes sense. No? Okay, that's good. I'm glad I don't have to spend too much time on that. So, then our third option for recovering monotheism from these passages is this is just the Trinity appearing in the Old Testament. Well, this is not really an option uh, with Psalm 82. So we talked about how human view fails because of Psalm 89, uh, but the Trinity also doesn't work because God is judging them for, un, uh, for being corrupt. So if we were, and also, I don't think we would want to use plural language, like plural Elohim, in order to talk about the Trinity, because that would be denying a lot of the classical doctrines about the Trinity that we as Christians embrace from the 
Nicene Creed, for example. So it might seem strange for us to be stepping away from monotheism uh, because it's just what we always, have always understood Christianity and Judaism to be. Uh, but it's a term that was specifically come up with, uh, I'll point this out to you, in the 1650s uh, in order to specifically separate monotheism, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, to specifically distinguish those things from atheism. Uh, so we don't need to be uh, committed to this term. We don't need to be married to this term in the same way that we need to be committed to the Bible, as we explained when we were talking about uh, inspiration and inerrancy. Those are the things we need to be committed to, whereas monotheism, not so much. So, uh, you guys might have in mind the verses I brought up at the beginning when it says, you are God, there is none beside you, you alone are God. Um, and you shall worship no other God, you shall, you shall have no other God beside me. So that, and you might think, well, that's obviously monotheism, and so the Bible has a contradiction in it. That's not really the case, because if we look in the Bible again, at Zephaniah 2.15, we see Nineveh saying in her heart, Nineveh the city, uh, I am, and there is no one else. There, there is more or less none beside me. Or Babylon, I am, and there is no one besides me. These cities aren't obviously... The, the, the populace or the rulers or the cities themselves aren't understanding themselves to be the only cities on earth. They're just so far above all the other cities that they call themselves the only one. Or if uh, you've heard the phrase par excellence, uh, that, um, or you'll hear, hear the term the, um, in order to say, like, this is the only thing you need to turn to. This is the only resource you need to consult. This is the only book you need to read on the subject. This is the only restaurant you need to go to. This is the thing. Uh, so it's saying that language with exclusivity, but it's not implying the non-existence of these other entities, whether it's restaurants or books or gods. So this is proto-Trinity. No, you lose. Go to jail and do not collect 200 if you pass go. So once again, the Trinity is not plural Elohim. Uh, we have reasons from our, our, our classical understanding of the Trinity uh, to reject that, uh, to say if, if we see plural language of Elohim, then we're not talking about the Trinity. God isn't judging the Trinity for a corrupt administration, um, and the Trinity itself isn't judging unjustly. Samuel, not me, the prophet, is not a member of the Trinity. And the biblical authors were not thinking about the Trinity. They didn't have this uh, picture in their head. It's like, oh, 1,500 years from now, Christians are going to be needing to think about the Trinity, so we ought to drop a few hints for them. That would be awfully kind of us, wouldn't it? No, that's, that isn't what they were thinking. And when we compare it to the literature of the time, we know what they were, uh, at least what they could have been thinking. And um, so we, we don't need to re rely on the Trinity to get rid of this language just because it might be spooky to us. There are some decent arguments of the Trinity from the Tanakh. Zach covered them uh, last semester, and I will be briefly reviewing some of those arguments, uh, but this is not one of them. Sorry if uh, me drinking water sounded strange on Zoom. You guys are right next to my mouth. <laughs> so this also applies to Genesis 1.1 whenever we're reading uh, let us make man in our own image. That is also not Trinitarian language. Okay. So what is it? I've given you all these examples of things that it's not. Um, if you'd like to speak up in defense of one of the options I dismissed, now's the time to do so before I actually define what we can what we can go with this as, what we can define it as. Okay. 
So first off, Yahweh is an Elohim, but no Elohim is Yahweh. As we discussed, Elohim is a specific term which conveys a few things. Among them, uh, it just means a pr primarily spiritual existence. You exist in the heavenly realms. And so us humans who, are in, who have bodies and don't exist in the heavens are not Elohim. Um, and Yahweh is an Elohim, but he's not just an Elohim. It's, he has differences between the other Elohim and himself. Also, from the verses we've examined, uh, not, not only the verses we've examined, but the verses that we've examined are sufficient to construct this basic biblical narrative to where God creates the universe while the council watches and praises him, uh, and they are not happy, apparently, with how things turned out, and so they rebel, leading to corruption of humanity, which God judges with a flood as we see in Genesis 7. The nations collaborate to rebel against the authority of God and, make them, and try to make themselves gods. God rejects this rebellion by disinheriting humanity and assigning them divine rulers. And he preserves for himself a remnant through the nation of Israel. Um, so these, rulers, uh, these divine rulers are corrupt, and so God, in order to rescue humanity, has to claim his portion, Israel, uh, by making his covenant with Abraham. And through this covenant, he plans to restore all of the nations into his family through the victory of the Messiah. That was what the Jewish people were expecting um, at the time uh, Jesus comes around. The, the Old Testament comes to a close. We have a, a second temple period, and we're expecting a Messiah, and then we don't see anything. Um, and until we get, of course, to the New Testament. So the Messiah comes to restore God's rule over all the nations and defeat these spiritual powers. That might not be something that is obvious when you're reading the New Testament uh, at first glance without this background information, but part of Jesus's, part of the Messiah's job is to wrest control of the nations back from these spiritual entities, back from these spiritual powers. So, the Israelite Divine Council. We, we've, we've discussed it. We've discussed the role of angels, uh, archangels, or B'nai, Elohim, spiritual beings. We've got Elohim. We've got other divine beings. But we haven't explained why we have two Yahwehs next to each other. And the reason we have two Yahwehs next to each other is because the Bible often has two Yahwehs next to each other using these particular identifiers. So, we have the angel of Yahweh and the God of seeing. Uh, the angel of Yahweh found her, Hagar, uh, by a spring of water in the wilderness and uh, on the way to Shur, and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? Etc. Etc. The angel of Yahweh said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her, the angel of Yahweh also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of Yahweh said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael because Yahweh has listened to your affliction. And then Hagar's response to this is, So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. You are a God of seeing. Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. We, we discussed that uh, angel is, is a functional term, and so what this being is doing is just delivering a message, but then Hagar calls this being a god, and also calls this being, you are the god who looks after me. I have seen him who looks after me. Well, who's looking after her? We already know that the, that the who's looking after her is Yahweh. So, then we have Angel of Yahweh and the Presence. Uh, the Angel of Yahweh went up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give to your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. So the Angel of Yahweh is, uh, led them out of Exodus and led them to this land, um, and, and there is this covenant between them and Yahweh. But then 
in the New Testament, when we get to Jude, verse 5, Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Uh, and whenever we're describing the angel of Yahweh in Exodus, God says, um, He shall not forgive your trespasses, for my name is in him. So whenever it, um, whenever Hagar, um, uh, so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. Um, the, the name of the Lord is a title that's also used to describe this, uh, this angel of Yahweh. Um, so the angel of Yahweh, the name, or Hashem, and the presence. Okay? I shouldn't have gone back. That was too many animations to click through. Okay. So two powers in heaven. For centuries, Judaism felt no discomfort with the notion of two Yahweh figures. The idea was referred to as the two powers in heaven. Now, I should warn you, whenever you're looking this up, whenever you're Google searching, in order to fact check me, the two powers in heaven, you should note that that was the term used to describe the heresy, as in the rabbis said, this is a heresy, and we're describing it as the two powers in heaven. Uh, so you might not be able to find, um, you'll, you'll either find Heiser's work or you'll find uh, Jewish polemics against this idea. But before the second century AD, it was not widely understood to be a heresy. So it was an idea who, if you walked up to a, a Jew in the second temple period, you would not necessarily expect them to den deny this claim uh, vigorously. Uh, and they might even be speculating as to the identity of the second power in heaven. There is a scholar by the name of Alan Siegel who documented this controversy and documented the beliefs of the, of the, of the Jewish people during the Second Temple period. So once again, we return to the Ugarit, Ugaritic Divine Council. And we have Baal, co-regent and god of the storm. He's often depicted with a lightning bolt in his hand, much like Zeus. That, that's, that's the way I think of it. And he's called the Cloud Rider. So, and Kothar u Kassis, I'm sorry, I really should have practiced the pronunciation of these terms before I stood up at this podium. I apologize. Did I not tell thee, O Prince Baal, nor declare, O Rider of Clouds, lo thine enemies, O Baal, lo thine enemies, wilt thou smite? I'm going to skip over the rest of this because it's got a lot of thous and thines. The Cloud Rider. What manner of enemy has arisen against Baal, a foe against the charioteer, charioteer of the clouds? Then we get to Daniel 7. I kept on watching until the Ancient of Days was seated. His clothes were white like snow, and the hair on his head was like pure wool. His throne burned with flaming fire, and its wheels burned with fire. A river of fire flowed out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were serving him, with millions upon millions waiting before him. The court sat in judgment, and record books were unsealed. I continued watching because of the audacious words that the horn was speaking. I kept observing until the animal was killed and its body destroyed and given over to burning fire. Now as to the other animals, their authority was removed, but they were granted a reprieve from execution for an appointed period of time. I continued to observe the night vision, and look, someone like the Son of Man was coming, accompanied by heavenly clouds. He approached the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. To him, dominion was bestowed along with glory and a kingdom, so that all people, nations, and languages are to serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. It will never pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Daniel 7, 9-13. So we have these two ideas running in parallel. Someone in the heavens who is being given authority, being compared to Baal, superseding Baal specifically. We discussed how uh, different, uh, how you can take an idea just because it's a shared idea in your culture, 
or you can take an idea to use as a polemic. So this idea is clearly being used as a polemic to say, Baal, you are not the cloud rider, you are not the co-regent of the heavens. So we have this idea, and we have another idea running in parallel that you have Yahweh and the angel of Yahweh who are often confused with one another, at least by the humans with whom they are speaking. Um, and and even, even the language itself uh, in the Bible, uh, Jacob re refers to um, the God who made his covenant with me, the God who delivered me, the angel, uh, may the angel bless these boys. Um, so there's confusion amongst these terms. I am the Christ, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So Jesus understands himself to be in this position. He's taking this idea that existed in Second Temple Judaism and saying, this is me, the one that you were speculating about, the one that you were expecting, the one that you were uh, hoping for, the, one, the, the person whose authority you were hoping to be instituted on this earth in order to get you from underneath the th thumb of the Romans, uh, among others. And obviously Jesus' mission has a bit of a wider scope than just dealing with the Romans. He says, I am the Son of Man. I am coming with the clouds of heaven. So, the most uh, familiar way to talk about this information is um, to talk about Jesus being more than one person. Um, and it's crucial that we recognize that this theology doesn't originate in the New Testament. There are multiple Yahweh figures, and Jewish thinkers would have been more or less comfortable with this idea. Even if they didn't affirm it, um, there were those who affirmed it, and then there were just those who were like, hey, yeah, that's an idea, that's something an interesting uh, observation you've made from the text. And then Jesus of Nazareth comes along and a lot of rabbis all of a sudden have to say, yeah, that's heresy. Uh, like I said, Jesus' plan extends far above and the charity, charioteer of the clouds obviously plays a role in, in the process of God declaring judgment on these corrupt Elohim. Uh, so when, uh, whenever we read the New Testament, we need to keep an eye out for this language because the, the writers of the New Testament knew their Old Testaments probably a lot better than we did. So whenever we're reading Paul and Peter and Jude, we need to have these things in mind. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, so we've covered death, we've covered life, we've covered angels, nor rulers, okay, human rulers and whatnot, nor, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers. So rulers and powers um, we have uh, have have often been understood, especially powers, to refer to these spiritual beings, to these divine powers against which Jesus is competing. And Paul, by saying that these powers will not be able to separate us from Jesus, that Jesus has won a decisive victory, is... Um, if we went back to our uh, divine council org chart of, of the Hebrews, and we saw Yahweh right next to Yahweh, that's because uh, Jesus, much like Yahweh, is, uh, there, there is no competition. There is no struggle. There, there is no battle uh, to be lost between Yahweh or Yahweh and these divine beings, these divine powers. So, uh, that is pretty much all I have. I rushed through the content, and so I'd be surprised if uh, there were not some burning questions that I could hopefully deal with. Yes? I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this, uh, but... So, so as you work through the, the, the last um, parts of your presentation, and we're talking about Jesus and, um, and how he, he might fit into that diagram when you have the Yahweh next to Yahweh, right? Um, uh, is the polytheism that we're examining in the Old Testament, is that just, does that just end up becoming a justification for our understanding of the model of the Trinity? 
as well as the fact that, I mean, you do have the Heavenly Council, and you do have the, 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 the different maybe classes of, of, of heavenly beings there, but, um, but, but I, I'm just curious about the Trinity there. So, <clears throat> that's a good question, because, I, 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 like I said, whenever we are introducing this second Yahweh figure, we are kicking Baal out of the picture. The way I have been thinking about it, and perhaps it stands that that needs to be corrected, but the way I've been thinking about it is that Baal is this figure who has improperly claimed status alongside the god above all gods. He has, he has claimed the status, and he has claimed this status by competing with the other gods of the Canaanite religion, the Canaanite mythology. The picture that we are actually dealing with is that the God above gods has no equal um, and has, um, there is no God beside Yahweh. So then whenever we look, it's like, oh, there's an empty space beside Yahweh, and the biblical authors filled that role with Yahweh. Um, not explicitly, um, and so by the time we get to the Second Temple period, there is speculation, and people are thinking, oh, it's Adam, or oh, it's Enoch, or Seth. There are a lot of names being thrown out as far as suggestions for who could be this second power in heaven. And I should point out, we don't necessarily, uh, when we're affirming the Trinity, we aren't really affirming a second power in heaven. That's just where the idea um, traces back to. Uh, whenever we are affirming the Trinity, we're really just affirming one power, um, one essence, one God, uh, shared by the three persons. Now, I think the, the real important thing to point out, is, so it is a distinct idea, um, distinct and, and therefore not dependent on the divine council mythology, if you want to call it that, of the Canaanites. Another thing that's important to point out is you don't expect a Jew of the first century AD to suddenly go back on their religion and adopt monotheism. So firstly, I, th I think that they were prepared with language of, of divine plurality. They, they were prepared to accept other heavenly beings interacting with us on earth. They probably thought that that was a very, very bad idea because it turned out so poorly many other times. Um, but they were prepared for, to accept that reality. And then the idea of the two powers in heaven, they were prepared to accept a Messiah whose origins were in the clouds, if you will, or coming with the clouds. Yes, Dante. Dante. So Jesus was created to fill a role that was... No, no, no. I, I, like I said, I, I think it would be... Created, I mean like created by God, not by man. Oh, still no. <laughs> um... We, uh, so at Rational Christie, we are going to affirm the proto-Nicene, uh, trying to be inclusive to our Orthodox member, uh, a proto-Nicene understanding of the Trinity. And we derive this understanding from the New Testament. Um, when, when we say that I, I would flip the language of your question around. So when you say Jesus was created to fill this role, I would rather say this role was created to be filled by Jesus. Um, and that, that comes into the picture whenever we're talking about... That Jesus did not exist prior to the other gods messing up. I think he did. Um... So here's a, a question you're not asking, but I think by answering it, it will point you in the right direction. So God is God. 
we understand him as Christians to be a, a tr- have a Trinitarian nature, but and he existed from all eternity. He existed uh, without any other created beings, and then he decides to create beings. He knows these beings will rebel against him. Uh, he knows that he doesn't have to depend on these beings. He doesn't have to give them any authority. He doesn't have to do any of this, uh, but he creates them nonetheless. He creates these divine beings. He creates these Elohim, and he creates humans with whom he states, I'm going to bring you into my family uh, and give you authority. Why does he do that? He doesn't need to do it. If something goes wrong, he will need to respond uh, in order to maintain justice, in order to maintain his nature, or up- uphold his nature, which includes justice. He will need to respond. So, but why does he do that? And that, that's a question I'm not fully prepared to answer tonight. That, that's something I think should be central to your theology, which is why I really wanted to introduce this divine counsel idea, is because it's quite central to the way that the biblical authors thought. So it's a question that you have to answer with your theology. Uh, but the key is once we understand who God is, which we can do so adequately uh, j- just by going off of the uh, New Testament, but in order to understand the whole picture, uh, we, we could honestly do so adequately. Um, you, that, that's what the Nicene Creed and, and so many other versions of the Nicene uh, of, of different creeds have been written to address: is who who is God? What is He like? But we have to turn to the Bible in order to address the question of how has He interacted with reality? How has He interacted with humanity? And it's not um, so. Jesus is not a created being. He's not a created Elohim, and every time He appears. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, he is placed in a position equal to Yahweh. Just do something simple. Give us, give us a definition of the word divine. Hmm. I want you to clarify it because obviously the scripture has words in it like divine. You talked about the divine council. You talked about God as being the, or Yahweh as being the head of this so called divine council. And I think it's worth fleshing out what does that word divine mean? What are its limits? How, how are God's part, some of God's divine attributes communicable to his? And I think another question related to that is, why does this language mean we have to abandon the term monotheism? Or or why why might we be better off for abandoning the term monotheism if this term divine means God or means something less than Yahweh? So, uh, but to answer the question divine, uh, Heiser says that the term Elohim is just a term which defines the place of residence. If you are a spiritual being, you live in the spiritual realm. Um, That is your your primary means of existence. I think that there might be a little bit more to that. I think think Heiser touches on it um, by defining imagers. So whenever he's defining uh, what is the image of God, it's not a set of properties, it's rather a responsibility. So whenever I I mention that angels, uh, whenever we're talking about angels, it's functional language. I think that the term imagers is also a a functional language. So when we're talking about these Elohim, they're they're beings who are not angels, they've been given responsibilities, um, and I, I think that we can understand them to be part of God's family. They're called sons of God and part of God's council. So I think we would be justified in calling them imagers. Similarly, in the Pauline epistles, I wish I had put these verses in my slides, 
there is language which has been recently read to suggest that there is an elevation of humans once they've been redeemed. Once after the resurrection, humans are going to be elevated into this divine council. You might be familiar with the verse that says, do you not know that we will be judging angels? So when it comes to the term divine, I think part of it is uh, as, as simple as you live in the heavenly realms. Um, I think another part of it is this responsibility. I think, like you said, the communicable attributes of God. He can um, give people these properties. Uh, he, he can bestow these properties, um, and, and we, we call them gods, um, in order for these people to re reside with him, be part of his family, be adopted into his family, and to have authority. That Satan and his minions, as part of the spiritual realm, be divine. So, there is a, you've stepped on a bit of a minefield. I'm not, I, that was my question. Oh, no, no, no. I, I want to step into the minefield. <laughs> we're going to navigate the minefield, and we're also not going to shy away from any of the particular mines. Uh, exactly. Uh, and I really like this question. Um, so, Satan and his minions are not divine. Uh, so, first off, the term Satan um, is not a name in the Old Testament. It is a title. The Satan. And it is... The, it means the accuser um, or the blasphemer. And the picture we get in Job is somebody who is accusing or, or, or trying to present a case in the heavens, trying to present a case that uh, this individual Job is not as squeaky clean as he looks, more or less, I'm paraphrasing. So whenever we... Uh, uh, we, we don't have 100% uh, certainty. We, we, we don't necessarily need to assign this figure from Job to the figure from uh, the Garden of Eden. The figure from the Garden of Eden is referred to as the Nakash, the serpent. But he's also, that, that language is a bit of a triple entendre, which to spare you the details of the Hebrew, and I'd encourage you once again to turn to the Unseen Realm of the Naked Bible Podcast, or the, there's a uh, project, the Bible Project, which summarizes a lot of what I've said and summarizes the biblical narrative and traces it through multiple books of the Bible, um, which suggests that the Nakash is uh, a divine being and has... Um, origins in the divine council. Uh, and as we see from G Genesis and Psalm 82, we know that these sons of God, that these divine beings can rebel, because they do. So when we're using the term define, one thing that uh, we aren't referring to, we aren't necessarily referring to perfect beings. Why is Satan not included in or in the org chart? Yeah. Um, part of it is because uh, I don't uh, part of it because he's not explicitly um, placed in, in the chart by uh, the Bible. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly where to put it. it, it we don't get details. We don't get um, the sort of details that we as modern, rational people might prefer. We, we want a very scientific, detailed explanation. Well, he in, he's in the unseen realm. Um, but yes, that, and, and whenever we look to Ezekiel, Ezekiel I'm sorry, I can't give you the chapter at the moment. But whenever we look to Ezekiel, the descriptions of the king of Tyre, 
also, uh, which are meant to, uh, the king of Tyre is obviously a separate human individual, but he is being referred to with the same language that's used to describe Satan, uh, the Satan, the serpent of the Garden of Eden, uh, and it refers to him using, uh, it refers to him as shining or glittering uh, with, I believe, skin like uh, sapphires or, or lapis lazuli, um, and uh, to, to, to give this impression that this is a divine being we're dealing with. So I just wanted to comment that I think the discussion of this word divine is a, a significant kind of equivocation that happens here that Heiser is guilty of, I think, not really clarifying. Because exactly like you said, Heiser uses the term divine just to mean any spiritual being. But for most of us in a Western Christian tradition, we recognize the word divine as kind of the way the medievals used it. You know, the divine essence is the essence of the one true God. Like, only God is divine. Like we use God, or we use the word divine as, or divinity as a synonym for the essence of God. So we talk about the divinity of Christ. We aren't talking about Christ being a spiritual being. We're talking about him, him being co-equal to God. So um, I think it's, an, it's just an equivocation. There's two different ways we might use this term. And Heiser uses it in a very broad sense, which is very much in conflict with the more medieval Christian sense of the word. And I should point out that this equivocation doesn't just start with... Uh, the medieval period, or with Heiser, it starts uh, kind of with the Septuagint, um, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament that the writers of the New Testament would have been most familiar with. Um, and at, at several points where the original text, which we are able to more or less reconstruct from the Masoretic text and the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint will sometimes obscure that language by referring to angels. The question is not really how did the medievals understand the word divine, how, not how, how does Heiser understand the word divine, how did the, how did the authors of the Old Testament understand the, the Hebrew word that we translate divine, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's, you know, getting back to, you know, the original meaning of the text through those human authors. And, and I think that that's, to me, that's unclear because of the, of the different uses of the word divine you know, that have been handed down to us through, through the centuries. I think that a good definition to work with is that the term Elohim, at the very least, which you could translate divine beings, generally just refers to spiritual beings, beings who don't have permanent bodies, who, who aren't meant to be uh, like us humans are, are supposed to be body and spirit. So also when we're talking about a dead spirit like Samuel, though he, he is a divine being. And it just refers to a, a, it refers primarily to a place of residence. I would also add on um, that there are responsibilities and privileges associated with the term that perhaps certain heavenly beings, you might say, like angels, don't have. But that is me... Uh, deviating from Heiser in order to respond to that particular concern that I share, that he's, he's not being particularly precise with his language. What I'm about to say is, really, I think, uh, fodder for a forum after this meeting, uh, you know, maybe on, online or what have you, but, you know, I don't, I didn't hear any discussion of the Nephilim. I didn't hear any discussion of the 24 elders. Uh, mentioned in Revelation. I didn't hear any discussion of the heavenly beings in, 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 or in the throne room of Isaiah 6. You know, so there's, you know, I think there's a lot of stuff here to unpack you know, that, we, that we don't have time for in a meeting like this, but it's certainly worthy of our sort of kind of struggling with the, the biblical data and, uh, and, and maybe with Heiser yourself and with, you know, with the website uh, kind of refining you know, what we think about the word divine. What we Think about whether the whether the, the scripture 
promotes this idea in anyone of college years. So, fascinating. And um, to, to, whenever I opened up this meeting with the, um, a, a, a statement of the controversy from a, a fellow Aggie, so, um, we covered a lot of territory that we that that I said we're not going to be able to to cover all these particular issues, but I think that this particular understanding this worldview that um, let's call it a, a Mesopotamian worldview that the biblical authors would have had would have shared um, would not have felt the need to deviate from uh, is valuable when tackling those controversies. There's a question from the Zoom, uh, which I would very much like to read. It says, what is the origin of the imperfection in these divine beings? Uh, where, did the, where did the impurity, where did the evil, where did, these, um, where did rebellion come from? What is its origin? And I'll summarize by saying this. This question is far above my pay grade because... It is the sort of thing that philosophers have tried to answer. It is the sort of thing, uh, sorry, philosophers have to try and answer this. Christian philosophers, theistic philosophers specifically, I suppose. So uh, philosophers have to try and answer it. Theologians have to try and answer it. Biblical scholars have to try and answer it. And then they all have to make sure that their answers are in step with one another. The way Heiser puts it, is relatively simple in the unseen realm is he he attributes it to the free will of these divine beings and he attributes it to um, the free will uh, the free will of humans just the, the he, he puts it rather simply that their priorities and God's priorities can deviate from one another in my opinion that is too simple of an answer, um, but it's uh, Heiser's answer, and there are more sophisticated answers that you can get from theologians and philosophers, as one I plan on thinking about and talking about for the future, but it's one I can't delve into for now. Um, if, there's, if anybody else would like to say something about that issue, I, uh, this is the sort of thing that needs to be discussed by a lot of people. Anybody want to try tackling the problem of evil? Julie? Oh, okay. No, no, not at all. But I do have a follow-up about that. So, okay, so they are fallen, and I'm assuming they all, in that Elohim, uh, below God, that realm, um, rebel, right? That's the, that's the sense you get, right? There's not one that's still um, aligning himself with Yahweh. So Dante asked earlier about archangels, and, and like I said, I think that this language has been introduced in order to specifically distinguish um, amongst the angels and to introduce this idea of hierarchy, at least within the angels, perhaps a hierarchy that extends beyond angels. Uh, it, it said that um, there's a narrative which is recounted by Paul, which uh, says that Michael had to contend with the prince of Persia. So I think uh, so firstly there are still heavenly beings, angels and archangels who have loyalty to Yahweh. I I don't think it's a stretch to say that there are other Elohim who have loyalty to Yahweh. Uh but then also uh the biblical worldview is that the corruption within the nations uh, is perpetrated by these corrupt Elohim and who, who are judging unjustly and, and giving power to the unjust and um, not giving mercy and justice to the downtrodden. So if you could point out a nation on earth which has not uh, dealt with this kind of corruption, or, or if you could point out... Um, uh, so, some area which is not corrupted, then perhaps we're dealing, uh, but I, I don't think, I think that'd be a bit optimistic. Does he say any, does he specifically say anything that then um, for them there's no redemption? There's no way of, of, of redeeming their fallen nature? 
the language of the New Testament emphasizes Jesus' victory over these beings. And it specifically emphasizes him freeing humanity from these, uh, from these influences. So I don't think that there is room in the biblical text, in the biblical narrative, for the redemption of these divine beings. And whenever it comes to adoption language, I think that by extension, we're also referring to re uh, replacement language in which believers will take the place of these divine beings in the council. So that, that is Heiser's understanding of the, of the biblical narrative. And I think that is in line both with the Old Testament and Paul's language. I'm pretty sure that Heiser has some online content specifically directed at the question of whether angels can be uh, redeemed. Definitely there's some podcast episodes where he addresses that in Q&A, but I think he also has some blog posts. Hmm. Uh, I, there's another question from Zoom. It says, is the distinction between polytheism and henotheism significant for this conversation? Which I discussed, not in great detail. Uh, I, I think it's the case. Heiser likes the term henotheism as, as an individual by the name of H. H. Rowles is trying to, he's trying to put forward a new definition or a more precise definition of henotheism, which applies specifically to the uh, Hebrews uh, and presumably to other similar leaf structures to where the distinction between the gods is a theological, ontological one, rather than just, oh, this is the way it happened to turn out. The way henotheism is currently defined in the mainstream conversation uh, surrounding this data is, it, it's just a specialized form of polytheism. So, perhaps they're on the road to monotheism, or perhaps they're on the road to more polytheism. Uh, because the un the understanding of how polytheism originates is uh, these these people are getting together and they have competing views of what God is like and they have competing views of what they need to depend on God for and so then they just decide to live amongst each other with these different views of God and these therefore these different gods that's the secular um, scholarly understanding of the origin of polytheism, and so henotheism c could honestly exist on either side of that. Uh, another uh, a comment, Hebrews, uh, he, uh, chapter 2, explicitly denies angelic rede redemption. So uh, you, you will have to check that for yourself. I don't have Hebrew 2 pulled up. Okay. I... Uh, I thank you all for bearing with me through this presentation. I appreciate the, the chance to stand up here for the first time and give this presentation. And hopefully uh, it won't be the last. Um, it's definitely been an experience. Um, but before I go, I'm going to try and leave you with some uh, decent takeaways. So number one. Monotheism, polytheism, and henotheism, the, 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 the problem with those terms is that they, they lack precision to describe the biblical worldview, and we want precision when we're uh, describing the biblical worldview in order to appreciate the Old Testament and then the New Testament. It's important to have this worldview in mind in order to read the Old Testament the same way Peter, Paul, and Jude read the Old Testament, and of course the same way that it was written by its original authors. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is Yahweh. Uh, that much is clear when you read the biblical narrative as a cohesive whole, and when you try to isolate these passages which point to the, uh, a polytheistic interpretation, these passages also affirm a very distinct um, picture of Yahweh. So we can, we can rest assured that there were not mainstream Jewish thinkers 
There were not biblical authors who were convinced that Yahweh was just one, one among many. Uh, and then number five, there is a second being associated with the appearances of Yahweh throughout the Tanakh, and uh, we understand this being to be revealed in the New Testament as Jesus. Okay. We've already gone through, I think, a lot of the discussion and a lot of the questions which need to happen, uh, and we are out of time. So I hope you will contact me with more questions, especially as you continue to engage with the resources we have recommended to you tonight, including uh, most of uh, what Heiser produces. Maybe his fiction will not be uh, useful to you in this endeavor. Um, his, his podcast, and then especially the Naked Bible, uh, sorry, the Naked Bible podcast, uh, but especially the Bible Project. So, all right.